It's a great honor to uh, give these lectures at the Ninth Bangalore School on Statistical Physics, which has an outstanding reputation. So it, it is indeed an honor to be asked to talk here. And thank you very much, Abhishek, for the invitation. Actually, I have a disclaimer. And if Abhishek had known this, uh, uh, perhaps he wouldn't have asked me to give these uh, lectures. This, this is actually the first time I've given a series of lectures on quantum computing. However, I found it was very uh, helpful, very useful in doing the preparation for these lectures. So I hope that you, when listening to the lectures, will also find them to be useful. So first of all, some uh, references. The standard reference on quantum computing is this thick home here, the first reference here, Quantum Computation and Quantum Information by Nielsen and Chang. It's a very heavy book, it's very dense, and I don't know anybody who has systematically read it from cover to cover. However, there's a lot of stuff here, and if you, it's very useful for selective reading. A more concise uh, text is Quantum Computer Science by David Mermin. As you can see, it's a much slimmer volume, which is a good thing. Uh, Mermin writes in a, is, in, his, in a very characteristic style, which most of the time is very nice and is occasionally irritating. Uh, I have to say, uh, this was not as an easier read as I was expecting it to be. It, uh, is, it, but it is certainly a concise book, and probably if you wanted to get into this field, this would be the, the one to go for. I also found it helpful to look at this uh, third book, Introduction to Quantum Physics and Information Processing by Radhika Vassan, and I found some of the things where I wished Mermin have been a bit clearer, are a bit clearer in this book. So I've you found the, these three books were useful material for this course. So, what is a quantum computer? It is one in which the information is processed using the laws of quantum physics rather than classical physics. So the processing is done by bits, so we will be using, which take zero or one in a classical computer, so we will be using quantum version of those two state systems, which are called Q bits. So that's what it is, but why should we be interested in it? Well, it turns out that there are a few, for now only a few, we hope there will be more, problems for which a quantum computer could solve more efficiently than a classical computer. We hope there will be more. Notice the use of the conditional could. A large quantum computer capable of solving problems which are not solvable on a classical computer does not yet exist. There are severe experimental difficulties in building a quantum computer, and I will allude to them, but I will not be going into great details on the experimental side and the experimental difficulty. So, how then is the quantum world different from the classical world? And from the point of view of this series of lectures, I would say in two ways, each of which gives rise to a different paradigm for quantum computing. So the first way in which the quantum world is different from the classical world is what we'll call quantum parallelism. So we know that if we have a two-state system, it can be comprised of a linear combination of two basis states. So we are perhaps as physicists, 
more used to thinking of a two-state system as something like the spin of an electron, which can be up or down. So the state up, we will then call zero, and the state down, we'll call one. So we call our basis state zero and one, but so we use the same notation as for uh, classical uh, computing. And this is for one of these two state systems or qubits. If we have a system of little n qubits, then our state psi can be written as a sum over all the 2 to the n basis states. Right? So we have one qubit, there's two basis states, two qubits, there's four, and so on. So we can sum over the basis states k with a coefficient alpha k, and k will, will start counting at 0, and we'll go up to, say, up to 2 to the little n minus 1. So there's a very large, exponentially large number of basis states, exponential, the number of basis states, big N, will be 2 to little n, where little n is the number of qubits. Incidentally, a particularly convenient way of doing the labeling when you have many qubits is just to write out the string of zeros and ones which the different qubits are in. So, for example, if we had one, two, three, four, five, six, system with little n equals six qubits, and qubits uh, one, two, and four uh, have uh, it values one, and qubit uh, the others are zero, then we could just use this as a binary number representing the state k, so this is 1, 2, 4, 8, this is 10, if, uh, if I got that correctly. 1, 2, 4, 8. So we act on quantum states with unitary operators. There's some operator u, which will transform the state psi into a different state, psi prime. So in this paradigm of quantum computing, we will start with some initial state, and we will act on it with a series of discrete unitary transformations. So note two things about these transformations. Because they are unitary, their inverse transformation exists. This will be crucial in what follows. So the quantum transformations are reversible. So a unitary matrix means that the inverse is the Hermitian conjugate, where this is the complex conjugate of the transpose. So if U is unitary, you know the inverse exists because it's just a complex conjugate of the transpose. And in fact, many, in many cases, the transformations we'll be doing, U will be real and symmetric, in which case U to the minus 1 is equal to U. Another thing to note is that these transformations are, of course, linear. So if we have an option u acting on a linear combination of psi 1 and psi 2. This is the same as u acting separately on psi 1 and psi 2. I want to emphasize that quantum dynamics is reversible. This will give us a different type of computation from the normal ones we're familiar with in classical computation. So now I have my state psi is a linear combination of two to the n basis states. I act on it with a unitary transform u. I'm acting in parallel on all two to the n components of that state. This is what I mean by quantum parallelism. 
So it looks like this is some potential fantastic gain. We have this exponentially large parallelism. But pretty quickly, once enthusiasm gets tempered, but when you figure out how am I going to get information out of this? I, do, I cannot get those two to the n pieces of information out. What I have to do is make a measurement. And as you know from quantum mechanics, when you make a measurement, you don't get two to the n numbers out. The system wave function collapses, as we often say, onto one of those states, so you get one number with the appropriate probability. So it looks then now, this may, this putative quantum parallelism is just an illusion. It isn't really there. As soon as we do a measurement, it seems that we've lost it. However, it turns out that for the few problems, by doing clever processing before you do the measurement, you can get information out which is sufficient to solve the problem in, it, perhaps by running the algorithm several times, usually a small number of times. Now, this is then, so these, this series of discrete unitary operators, the unitary operators are called gates in this jargon. So this is the gate model of quantum computing. This is the most commonly known one. We're going to represent a, the series of gates by a diagram, and these diagrams look rather like circuits, electrical circuits. So, so this is, this paradigm for quantum computing is, up, is called then the gate or circuit model. It's the most commonly described form of quantum computing. It uses quantum parallelism, and I will be spending the biggest part of the talk on this paradigm for quantum computing. But notice, we have a sum of a large number of terms here. And we act on this linear combination. But in order to preserve the quantum aspects of the problem, we have to preserve the relative phases of all these terms, some fairly high position. So that means that the system cannot be influenced by any external noise, which would destroy those delicate quantum phase correlations. So this is called decoherence. Decoherence is the bane of quantum computing. On the other hand, you can't completely isolate these qubits because when you want to, you've got to go in there and hit the qubits with this unitary operator. So it seems as if you're sort of in an impossible situation, you want these qubits to completely isolate it from the real world, except when you want to uh, uh, act with the unitary transformations. So this is a very serious problem, and because of that, the only quantum computers built so far using this um, gate model are for a very small number of qubits, maybe 10 qubits. People are working on a few tens of qubits. This is because this approach is so sensitive to decoherence. Now, we will, in part of the course, so how you can help a little bit by what's called error correction. So there is quantum error correction, and that will figure in part of the course. But nonetheless, decoherence is a big problem with trying to build quantum computers of this type. Now, so quantum parallelism is the first way in which the quantum world differs from the classical world. The second way, which I will talk about, is that you can have tunneling in quantum mechanical systems, which you cannot have in classical systems. And this plays a role when we want to solve a set of problems called optimization problems.
Now, in an optimization problem, we want to find the maximum or maybe the minimum of some function with constraints. And we're dealing with a non-trivial problem where the constraints conflict with each other, which in the jargon of condensed matter physics is called frustration. So it's an energy function which we're minimizing, and the energy function has a bunch of pieces, and we want to minimize the whole sum. But no value of the variables which you're, which you're using to minimize will simultaneously minimize each piece in the energy. There's frustration or competition. And so a simple algorithm where you just take one of the variables and take it to its value, which locally minimizes the energy, and the second one locally minimizes. This doesn't work because you have a complex energy landscape because of this effect of competition. Frustration means competition. So a pictorial scheme is that one imagines if this is the energy, and the energy is a function of many degrees of freedom, but we, but we have to project these many degrees of freedom onto one axis. And the difficulty is that there will be local minima, into which you can easily get trapped. Whereas what you would really want is the deepest well, the deepest valley, the global minimum. So how do you find your way to the global minimum when any simple thing you might do will get stuck in the nearest local minimum? Well, there was a, quite a long time ago, there was an idea or a general purpose algorithm to do that called simulated annealing. And for my purposes, I prefer to call it thermal annealing, for reasons that will become clear. So what we're saying is if you just go downhill in energy, you get stuck in the nearest local minimum. So let's be guided by statistical physics, guided by Monte Carlo simulations, and put in a temperature. So if we have a temperature, you, there's some thermal energy there, you're kicking the, the spins or whatever it is around, so although you can go down in energy, there's some probability you also go back up in energy. So if the temperature is not too low, and you're in this region, you have some probability of being thermally activated over these barriers. So these are the barriers. From one local minimum to another. This is called thermal annealing. And then the idea is the temperature goes to zero at long times, so that uh, you end up in, so that you don't have any extra thermally excited energy. And this works moderately well for, and its advantage is it's, it's a simple idea, and you can apply it really for anything. Now I would say that if you were given a particular problem, and you look up all the, um, recipes, all the algorithms for solving that particular problem, you can probably find something which is faster than simulated annealing. Simulated or thermal annealing is a, a general purpose algorithm which works pretty well for many problems. So what, what we're going to come to next is that whatever you can do with thermal fluctuations by putting in a temperature, you can also do with quantum fluctuations by putting in something in the expression for the energy in the Hamiltonian, which does not commute. 
So one can do, try the same idea with quantum annealing. Call that QA, simulated annealing, SA. So we, we might have some simple and in general classical Hamiltonian question. Well, I wasn't, I'm not going getting into to details at the moment. We are typically thinking of some sort of stochastic Monte Carlo type dynamics for the thermal annealing. But we could imagine we start off with our problem Hamiltonian that we want to minimize. And this may be, this is typically a classical model. It may typically involve Ising spins, which are values also two state systems, which take values plus or minus one. And we induce quantum fluctuations by adding to it another term, so-called driver Hamiltonian. And the driver Hamiltonian does not commute with the problem Hamiltonian. So if I, I can think of these SIs as plus or minus one, I can set, just call them Pauli spin operators, sigma z, which in the basis in which they are diagonal is also plus or minus one. So, so far, I haven't done anything. This is just a different way of writing the same thing. But now, if I have a driver Hamiltonian, which it has operators which don't commute with sigma z, e.g. sigma x, then these two don't commute. There is a quantum dynamics. There are fluctuations. And what can the, uh, the, the quantum system then do? Rather than so we, this is our typical picture. So our classical system. So this red is the classical system, which would have to have, be at a finite temperature and be thermally activated over that barrier. The quantum system can tunnel through. So we can make the fluctuations large initially by making this driver Hamiltonian very big, that's like making a temperature high in the thermal annealing. You put in the driver Hamiltonian with a big, a big driver Hamiltonian, you get lots of quantum fluctuations. So again, you can escape from the nearest local minimum. And eventually, just as you let the temperature go to zero in the thermal annealing, you let the driver Hamiltonian go to zero in the quantum annealing. And the hope is that you would stay in the state of, end up in the state of lowest energy. So the, this has received a lot of interest because it seems, and this is something that needs to be dis understood better, that this is not quite as sensitive to a certain amount of decoherence as the gate model, which depends on quantum parallelism. Any amount of decoherence kills you right away with this. But even if there's some noise, some decoherence, maybe you can still tunnel through, and you can get some quantum effects. So this second paradigm for quantum computing, which uses tunneling, we'll call this Quantum, a quantum annealer is a bit less sensitive, we think, to decoherence. And in fact, there are experiments by a Canadian company called D-Wave, about which you might have heard, 
which have a real system with 2,000 superconducting qubits doing this quantum annealing. So it's good that there's these real experiments, good that perhaps the effects of decoherence are not as serious, but there is still one thing one should mention, one caveat. There is no guarantee of a quantum speed up using this quantum annealing approach. The question is, is tunneling better through the barrier, better than thermally activation over the barrier? And there's no proof that in general for a problem of interest that it is better, there's no proof that it is not better. Whereas for the gate model, there are certain problems, and we will discuss one, probably two of them, where there is a known algorithm which is considerably faster running on a quantum computer than any known classical algorithm. So let me just summarize what we've... This one gets quite a bit of exercise with this board. Wait, this is what I want, I think. So different types of quantum computer. There is a quantum, a known quantum speed up. Sorry, I'm writing too small, I think. So. Speed up for some problems. Then there is, and we'll call this a quantum computer, such a device. And then there are the devices which use some sort of annealing or quantum annealing, and we'll call, we'll call those then, we won't use the word computer for that, just to distinguish them, we'll say these are quantum annealers. and less sensitive to decoherence, but no proved quantum speed up yet. And I should have mentioned for the gate model, very sensitive to decoherence. And so, quantum computer, quantum annealer, and I think I would like to mention briefly a third device, type of device, which I will call a quantum simulator. In fact, there's a, there's a very influential paper by Feynman in 1982, where this is what he talks about, where basically you're using some constructed model quantum system use, say, an artificial, by which is built by hand, quantum system to study another one. As in, let me give you an example. You are familiar with these materials called high temperature superconductors. They have remarkable properties. They superconduct at liquid nitrogen temperatures, and so this was a major advance. We think that these, the essential physics of high temperature superconductors is electrons hopping around in two dimensions in a plane, but they are strongly interacting with each other. So the strong interactions makes this problem very difficult to solve. 
Because of the strong interactions, you can't do perturbation expansion because your perturbation expansion is large and you have to include an infinite number of terms. You can use intuitive approximations, but then you don't really have any control over those, and who's to say that one person's intuition is any better than anybody else's? If you had a model of small size, then you could diagonalize on the computer the Hamiltonian and see what properties you can get. But since the number of states increases exponentially with the number of sites, you can only do very small lattices and extrapolating to a big system is problematic. For some problems, you can do quantum Monte Carlo simulations where on a classical computer, you try to simulate the quantum fluctuations of your system. And in some cases, this works, but in other cases, it does not. And one case it does not is where you have electrons. Electrons are fermions. They have this very strange property that if you have two electrons and you take one around the other, you don't get back the same wave function, you get the negative of the wave function. And this leads to the so-called minus sign problem in doing quantum Monte Carlo simulations for fermion systems. You generate your, your various configurations on the computer, and then you generate a new configuration, and you accept that new configuration with a probability, which is the ratio of the statistical weight for the new configuration divided by the statistical weight for the old configurations. But because of this pesky fermion character, you sometimes get negative statistical weights. The individual contribution can be negative. This is a so-called sign problem. And so at low temperatures and large sizes, the average sign tends to zero, and you really cannot do anything. But the, uh, supposing we could build a system in the lab of qubits which roughly corresponds to the model we think should describe high temperature superconductors, then we could look at that. And since it is a quantum system, it, it doesn't care about sign problems, it just does its own thing. So using artificially built quantum systems to study an, other quantum systems is a very active field at the moment. And out of these three scenarios, gate model, annealing and simulator, I think we're going to see real advances in the not too distant future in the quantum simulator field. Yes. Problems that uh, all three models can solve, are they, are they the same? Because this annealing seems like more like, you know, a search sort of an algorithm, but uh, the gate model is a much more general the gate model is potentially more general, and um, the, anneal the annealing is really for this class of optimization problems, which might sound restricted, but actually it's a very, very important class of problems. For example, we're all familiar with the speech recognition algorithms on smartphones, things like that. What is actually happening when you talk into your iPhone is that the software is figuring out, out of all the things you might possibly have said, what's the most probable thing that you actually did say. It's an optimization problem. Similarly for uh, image recognition. So, of course, image recognition, speech recognition, this is really of interest to the big boys like Google and Apple, and they are also interested in seeing if quantum approaches quantum annealing might be useful. Okay, so I'm not going to talk in this course about quantum simulators. I'm mainly going to talk about this gate model. Later on, I will talk about, towards the end, about quantum annealing. So this is sort of trying to give a very broad view of the, co the course. So we're going to start now talking about the gate model of quantum computing. So the, the only background that's needed for this course is a standard physicist understanding of quantum mechanics, which is certainly of no problem to this uh, audience. So the gate model, this is what most people mean when they talk about a quantum computer. 
So we've already said that the unitary transformations that we're going to use, we're going to start with some initial state and a prior sequence of unitary transformations, they are reversible. They're also linear, as we said before. So we need to think about reversible computing. So that's the first point I want to emphasize. Typical logical operations on classical computers are, as we'll see, not reversible. So we have to start thinking in a slightly different way. So we're going to, first of all, start by thinking classically. We're going to think of ordinary classical bits, 0 and 1. And perhaps perversely, but to smooth the transition to the quantum case, I'm going to use sort of a quantum mechanical notation, Dirac notation, to describe these. But we have to think that these are classical bits, 0 and or 1. I'm not allowed to have a linear combination because I'm doing things classically. I can also represent them by vectors. So 0, and this will all go through in the quantum case, will be 1, 0, and the other state 0, 1. And I emphasize that classically only these two vectors are allowed. So what reversible operations can we have? First of all, what about one-bit operators, bit operators that only act on a single bit? Well, there's not a whole lot, actually, classically. There will be more quantum mechanically, as we will see. There's the identity, which, of course, is not too exciting. One, zero, zero, one. So this does nothing, of course. Zero goes to zero. One goes to one. The other reversible one-bit operator classically is the bit flip. Zero matrix one, zero, one, one, zero. I will call that X. That's the standard notation. You will, of course, realize that as physicists that this is just the Pauli spin matrix sigma X but in the quantum computing community, you don't write sigma, you just write capital X. So obviously, what that flips, so 0 goes to 1, and 1 goes to 0. And you clearly see that X, if you do X twice, you, you flip and you flip it back, you just get the identity, and trivially you can square that matrix. So x to the minus 1 is equal to x. Clearly it is a reversible operation. And as I understand it, the identity and the flip are the only reversible one-bit operations which are permitted classically. So we have to go then to two-bit operations to see what, how we can transform the data. So this is where we have to realize that the, the standard operations, such as AND, or OR, or exclusive OR, are no good for us. They are not reversible. We have two bits going in and one bit coming out. You cannot reverse that. As a specific example, let me consider what's called the exclusive OR, and I'll explain what that, that is. So if we have two zeros, 
that gives a zero. Now, because it, the or part of the name, if, I, if one of the bits is one and the other is zero, I get a one. Similarly for the other way around, I get a one. If, it was, if I didn't have the x here, if I just had or, then if I, both bits were one, I would get one. But I'm taking the exclusive or, which will turn out to be more important, and x for exclusive means you only get, you get one if only one of the bits is one, but input bits is one, but not both. So one one goes to zero. So you immediately see that this is not reversible. If I tell you the answer is one, what was the input? Well, it could be one of two possibilities. So we're going to have to do something a little different, but there will be a reversible generalization of this exclusive or operator, which will play a very important role. So let me point out then that this exclusive or can be thought of in a different way, and we will need to think of it in a different way. We can think of it as bitwise addition modulo 2. So if x is a bit and y is a bit, this bitwise addition modulo 2 is written like this, a circle with a cross in it. So if, it, if these single bits, 0 plus 0 is 0, 0 plus 1 is 1, 1 plus 0 is 1, so that corresponds to these three, and 1 plus 1 is 0, and there's a carry bit, but we ignore that because I'm telling you it's modulo 2. So this, we're going to be dealing a lot with bitwise addition uh, modulo 2, and one can generalize this to more than one, more than a single bit. So if we had, for example, 0, 1, 0, and uh, 1, 1, 1, and do this bitwise addition modulo 2, 0 and 1 is 1, 1 and 1 modulo 2 is 0, and 0 and 1 is 1. So we will be doing quite a bit of this uh, later. Okay, so these are not reversible, although in a few minutes we will consider a generalization which is reversible, and that generalization will then be what we'll take when we do the quantum case. Remember, this is still classical. So, a reversible two-bit operator is the swap operator. So, if x and y are bits 0 or 1, and I'm still using this Dirac notation, though it's not necessary, but it means we don't really need to change anything in the notation when we go classically, and S is the swap operator, then I just get Y and X, the two are in the other order. So, if we want to think of a matrix representation for S, so I'm writing out the four basis states here, and similarly going down. So if the two bits are the same, nothing actually changes. So zero, zero, is on the diagonal, and 1, 1 is on the diagonal. So these are all zeros, so there's no change.
However, 0, 1 gets swapped to 1, 0 and vice versa. So I have off diagonal entries here and here, and di those diagonal entries are 0. So notice the swapping is because of the placement of these two ones. So again, you can check, we know that S squared is the identity, so it's reversible. The inverse is equal to the operator itself. First of all, it, it's trivially obvious looking at this. You swap twice, you get back where you were. You can also, if you want, do a bit of work and square this matrix, and of course you get the identity matrix. Now, we'll come to the most important two-bit operator for when we generalize to quantum mechanics. So we have to really make sure we understand this. Most important two-bit operator when we go to quantum mechanics. We haven't got there yet because we're writing everything out in the simpler classical case. It's called a controlled knot gate, or C knot for short. So, so this is a two-bit operator. The first bit we'll call the control bit, for reasons that will become clear. The second bit will be the target bit. Okay. So, in the action of this C naught, the control bit does not change. But the target control bit can change. So if the control bit equals 1, then the target bit flips. If the control bit is 0, then the target bit does not flip. So we'll write down what matrix that is. It's a 4 by 4 matrix. Later on, we'll be not using the rather cumbersome matrix operations. We'll use uh, more elegant and compact ways of doing it. But let's just write down. So when I write these two bits, the first one will be the control, and the second one will be the target. And this is the same, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. Okay. So if the control bit is 0, nothing changes. The control bit itself never changes, and the target bit doesn't change if the control bit is 1. So 0, 0 goes to the same thing. So then all these others are 0. Now, 0, 1, 0 is the control bit. 1 is the target bit. But since the control bit is 0, we don't change the target bit. That's the rule. So that's also just an entry on the diagonal. And we fill in the row and column with zeros. But now, for 1, 0 and 1, 1, the first of these is the target bit, and it's 1. So that says I have to flip the target bit. So 0 will become 1, and 1 will become 0. 
So we get off di ent diagonal entries here and here, showing that I've flipped the target bit when the control bit is one. So these are the off diagonal ones. Now I think you can see that what is happening, this, this is the control knot acting on X and Y, where the first one is the control and the second is the target. What, am I what do I end up with? As we said, the control bit doesn't change. And the target flips if X is one. Now how can I write that? Right, very good. So it's the X exclusive or, if you want, a modular two addition of X and Y. So why is that? Because if X equals 1, adding 1 to Y gives you, if Y is 1, you get 0. If Y is 0, you get 1. Let's call that complement of Y. Let's call that Y bar. And if x equals 0, then the bitwise addition leaves y unchanged. So this is what the control knot does. It's really very analogous to the exclusive OR. What's the difference? The difference is I've kept one of the input bits x as well. And by doing that, we'll see that for every output, there is a unique input, and I can reverse this procedure, which I could not do if I dropped this input bit. So let's see if we can check on that. So first of all, we see that um, this was C, right? You can, t you can tell just by pretty trivially, you square this matrix, you get the identity matrix. So C squared is equal to 1. So C to the minus 1 is equal to C. There is an inverse, and this is reversible. It's actually useful to use this way of writing rather than the matrix formulation. We're going to use more compact representations, which will be much easier than dealing with products of matrices. So we act with x, y, with c, and then we do it again. Okay. So let's the effect of the inner C, what does that do? It gives us X and then X plus what? Uh, I was writing it like this, comma X, bitwise addition plus Y. This is just a bracket. And then I do it again. Control bit doesn't stay the same. And I just take the bitwise addition of whatever is here, which is the new y, with x. So it's x plus bitwise plus x bitwise plus y. But x plus x bitwise plus x is always 0. Because either they're both 0, in which case it's obviously 0, or they're both 1, but 1 plus 1 is 0 modulo 2. So this is just x, y. So c squared is equal to 1. So this is a reversible generalization of the exclusive OR gate. The last thing to say, I want to say then about this classical gates, remember we're having to talk about reversible gates. 
what would we need to be able to do any reversible operation? How many gates would I need to be able to do any arbitrary reversible operation on the bits? We talk about the, the set of bits which is sufficient, sorry, the set of operations which is sufficient to do, of elementary operators, which is sufficient to do any operation on the bits to be a universal set. So this gets into some what arcane theory, which I'm not going to go to. If you want to look it up in Nielsen and Trang, you are welcome to do so. Somebody has a copy of that. Um, classically, which is what we're doing up to now, the one-bit gates we've been talking about and the two-bit gates are not enough, are not, in this jargon, universal. You need also some three-bit gates. Now, I'm certainly not going to prove that. I make that as a statement of interest because we're right now going to go to quantum. And the amazing thing is, when we talk about quantum operations, one bit plus two bit gates are universal for quantum mechanical. So in quantum mechanics, in quantum computing, one bit and two bit gates are universal. We don't need three bit gates to do any unitary transformation in quantum mechanics to some at arbitrary precision. Of course, unitary transformations can take continuous range of variables, and with a finite number of gates, you're only going to do that with a certain precision. But with one bit and two bit gates, you can construct any unitary transformation to some arbitrary precision. The more precision you need, the more gates you would need. This is a theorem which I'm again not going to prove. It's very useful though, because it's really tough to produce these qubits and these gates in, in quantum computers. Already, a two qubit gate, which will be the C naught, that's harder to do, and a three qubit gate will be even more difficult to do. And it's use convenient that you don't, strictly speaking, need three qubit gates for quantum computing. Okay, so I think I said that. Okay. So in fact, let me be a little more precise. So in quantum mechanics, the C naught, which we remember was the two cubic, plus several one qubit gates are uh, universal. As well, perhaps intuitively one can try to understand that because as we'll see when we go to quantum mechanics, there's a much richer set of one qubit gates than there is classically where all you've got is the flip and that's nothing else. There's more to it in the quantum case. So now we're going to consider quantum mechanical gates. Remember, gate is a way of saying operator. Now, consider quantum Okay. So, of course, we don't just have 0 and 1 anymore. We can have any linear combination 
a0 plus b1 with coefficients which can be complex such that the sum of the squares of the absolute value is equal to 1. And if we want to represent this as a vector, it would have the first entry in the vector will be the coefficient of 0, and the second one will be the coefficient of 1. So, what are the 1 qubit gates? Well, we have the swap as before, x, 0, 1, 1, 0, x acting on a vector a, b, just inverts the coefficients. But we have more now, quantum mechanically, because we have a much uh, bigger set of vectors that are allowed, that's why. So, another one which we have is, by analogy with the notation in quantum spins and Pauli operators, Z, which changes the phase. Of the one component. So Z acting on A, B is A minus B. So it's trivial to see that these operators, square these operators, both give one, give the identity. And as I've already mentioned, in physics, these will be called Pauli spin matrices, sigma z and sigma x. They're exactly the same thing, it's just we use doing a different notation. You will also recall from properties of Pauli spin matrices that they anti-commute. Zx, xz is minus cx. And trivial, of course, to check that by multiplication. You're probably already familiar with it. Now, the next one I'm going to write down is very important. It will figure extensively in what follows. It's called the Hadamard gate, sometimes called Hadamard Walsh. And capital H for Hadamard. And it's 1 over the square root of 2x plus z. So this is 1 over the square root of 2, 1, 1, 1, minus 1. So the minus 1 here is changing the phase of the 1 component. That comes from z. So, So H on state zero, so you go across the top row. It's one over root two, zero plus one. Symmetric sum of the two uh, basis states. And let's call this plus. We'll refer to it later. Hadamard on the other computational basis state, as we said, the sign of the one component is changed, and we'll call that state minus. 
if you want to think in terms of vector components, h on a vector a b is gives a plus b a minus b times one over root two. So we're going to use this Hadamard gate so much, we're going to need to get familiar with it and familiar with its properties. And we're going to use properties of Hadamard gates and combining Hadamards with X's and Z's as a way of evaluating certain quantities without going through the tedium of matrix multiplication, which is used operator relations rather than the individual components. So we're going to spend a couple of minutes on properties of the Hadamard gate. So we're going to need these later. That's why we're doing it. What's h times x? We'll see why we, this is useful in a moment. So h is 1, 1, 1, minus 1, and x is 0, 1, 1, 0. So that's 1 over root 2. And you get 1, 1, 1, yeah, minus 1, just doing the matrix multiplication. Supposing we take a product of H and Z, but in the opposite order, Z, H. So this is 1 over root 2, 1, 0, 0, minus 1, times 1, 1, 1, minus 1. Well, you can do that uh, trivial matrix multiplication, and the reason I'm going through this is it's exactly the same thing as we got in the line above. The same. So H, X equals x equals z h. Oh, I should have also mentioned, and you can also trivially check that, that h squared is 1, or the identity. So let's take this nice little equation, and supposing we multiply on the left, by h. So we get h squared x equals h z h. But we said that h squared is the identity. So if we sandwich z between a pair of h's, we get x. And similarly, if I take this equation and multiply on the right by h, we get h x h is equal to z h squared, but h squared is the identity. So if I sandwich x between a pair of Hadamards, I get Z. And we will be using these uh, relations quite extensively in what follows. So we read the circuit diagrams by convention from left to right. So if this represents a single qubit, this is the input then. And maybe it gets acted on by some gate, maybe an X. Z 
This will be the output. So in particular, if the input is x, lowercase x, this big x operator flips it. So 1 goes to 0, 0 goes to 1. So this will be the complement of x, which I'm calling x bar. And similarly, we might have Hadamards and so on. And you start with some input on the left, and you proceed, go to the right through a succession of gates, and you see what you end up with on the right-hand side. So the most important two qubit gate is the one that was already introduced in the classical context, the controlled knot, or C knot. So this is important. All right, so it's written in the following way. Right? We, it's two qubits, so there's going to be two lines. So we're going to feed in here, maybe this qubit is in x, this qubit is in y. Now, the notation is the following. This blob indicates that this is the control bit. And this circle with the x through it this is the target bit. So the control bit does not change, and the target bit becomes the bitwise sum modulo 2 of x and y, showing that if x is 1, this target, the lower qubit, flips. And otherwise, it does not flip. So, the, the statements like this refer to the computational basis, by which I mean zero and one, because you don't have to feed in either zero or one into these circuits. The whole point is that you can, you're going to feed in a linear superposition of stuff. But then to figure out what happens if you feed in a general superposition, you need you use the fact that these circuits are linear. So we'll give an example of that. So we'll have our C naught gate. And the, remember, the lower one is the target. And let me say the target is going to be 0 initially, fed in. But the control is a linear combination of 0 and 1 with coefficients alpha and beta. So, what do we get out? Well, feeding in the bit alpha zero, then the target qubit does not flip. So we get a piece of the output wave function where the control was zero, 
I'm indicating the control as the first of the two, and the target didn't flip, so it stays zero. But then we add to that, using linear superposition, beta times what we get when the control bit is one, and that causes the target to flip to be one. So they're both one. This is an example of using linear superposition to figure out what we get. So in particular, if alpha equals beta equals 1 over root 2, we have 1 over root 2 0, 0, plus 1, 1. So this is an example of what's called an entangled state. We have two qubits, but the state can not be written as a product of some sort of psi for qubit 1 and some wave function for qubit 2. So it cannot be written as a product wave function. We say it's entangled. And it states like these that were used by John Bell to um, point out certain very strange features of quantum mechanics, which really come from this entanglement. So this is called a Bell state. So let's call this beta zero zero as the first bell state. And there will be three others, and I will illustrate in a minute how we generate all these bell states from our control not gate by putting different inputs. So beta zero one is 1 over root 2, 0, 1, 1, 0. Beta 1, 0 is 1 over root 2. One zero. sorry, sorry, beta 1, 0. 0, 0, minus 1, 1. The reason for my notation will be clear in a minute. And beta 1, 1 equals 1 over root 2, 0, 1, minus 1, 0. So these are the four Bell states. They're all entangled states. And the reason for this notation is I can write all of them in the following form, beta x, y, where x and y take values 0 and 1 as 1 over root 2, if I didn't make a mistake, 0y plus minus 1 to the x times 1 and the complement of y. So you, if I didn't make a mistake, you can check that. And now, I'll, I did the last, I'm going to stop a, a little few minutes early in case there's questions, but what I would like to set you as an exercise is to show that all these four Bell states can be obtained by 
inputting into our controlled NOT gate. Initial states x and y, which is 0 or 1, but pass x, which is the control bit, through a Hadamard. And then the claim is what comes out is beta x1. So that's just an exercise that you can do in your own time. So it's been a long morning. I think I will uh, stop here. And uh, of course, if there are any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. And I should say, I guess there's a tutorial session this afternoon. So I will, of course, be there. And I'll also have these books if anybody wants to browse through those books. Questions? Could you give us some ideas to how uh, we ensure that there is no decoherence with tens or or what, uh, maybe hundreds of qubits, and then suddenly there is not suddenly, but progressively, how does decoherence occur and why does it occur? So you're asking about decoherence. How does it arise? Well, I'm not going to um, go into really the experimental details, but I will. what I will do in one of the later lectures is talk about how one can try to correct for those errors due to decoherence. And these quantum error correcting codes will work reasonably well if the error rate is pretty small. So if only a few qubits are wrong, then there is a scheme for uh, correcting them. I had one question. So, I mean, is it easy to give an example of this? Like you said, classically, you need at least three bits to. Uh... Yes. Okay. So, you need. Um, well, you can make the classical reversible gates universal if you add what's called a Toffoli gate. I probably can't spell. Where, now let me, it's three, okay, so it's three bits. And there are two control bits and a target. So this is X, this is Y, this is Z. So you flip, and so this is the target, and X and Y are the control bits. So you flip the target if both control bits are one. So this is a Toffoli gate, and you need these classically to get a universal set of gates. But in the quantum case, apparently, you can make a Toffoli gate out of several one and two qubit gates. And I couldn't, just on the spur of the moment, tell you how to do that. I'm pretty sure that's in Mermin. I don't remember. The questions uh, will break for lunch. And uh, then, so today there will be tutorials by Anupam and Peter. Uh, no, OK, so tutorials uh, only by Peter, I think. OK. Uh, Remind me the time. Uh, at 4.30. 4.30. 4.30 to and 6. Is it in here? It's same place, okay. right, yeah.